Hello, you lovely people. I'm 26 weeks into this journey of becoming an electrician. Now half a year, I've been through quite a few books in that time. I've had my first week in centre and I'm feeling really keen to crack on and get qualified. You know, my original goal was to get qualified in two years, but I reckon that we can get this done in a little under two years. So we better get cracking, right? What did I learn about this week? Well, I started this new book and I'm pleasantly surprised to find no health and safety. I'm hoping that with that exam out the way, that we'll be done with that. And self-employment, that looks like it's behind me too. The book started with comparing a defined scope electrician with a full scope electrician. But come on, we're not interested in changing light switch and, and installing showers. So we want to be full scope, right? This is what I'll need to get myself registered with a competent person scheme and get working on the things that we want to get working on. I started looking at drawings and how different drawings can help you design and then install electrical systems. Documents such as a plan of a building, a building specification and an electrical specification. We had an example of a bungalow that had 10 circuits ranging from a cooker and a shower, rings to lighting circuits. The specification was all laid out with the accessories that we'd need for the circuits and the layout diagram showed where those accessories needed to go. All of these documents built on previous knowledge that I had built on the electrical symbols and the drawing scales and so on. So it's important to understand these documents that we're going to talk about. It would then be up to me as the designer to consider the floors, ceilings, walls and joists and other materials. I'd need to take into account regulations such as safe zones, holes through joists and cable chases among other things. All of this was an overview with a focus on considering cable lengths, which we'll talk about next. Cable routes would be laid out on the electrical diagram, taking into account the things I mentioned previously. This is where I'd be measuring out cable to take into account the drops, including switches and sockets, and adding an extra 150mm for cable terminations and 450mm for the consumer unit. Because the drawing is to scale, it would mean you should be able to carry this out from a single drawing rather than the world's longest and most awkward tape measure. Bearing in mind that the property might not even be built at this stage, do you see how these drawings are useful for us? All of this information would allow me to work out how much cabling I would need for a job. At this stage of my studies, if I was to be dropped into a new build installation, I'd be quite out of my depth not knowing all of the regs that I'd need to consider. Something I would be a little bit more confident about though is what we looked at next, replacing a consumer unit. Don't you worry, my confidence doesn't mean that I'm gonna tackle this yet. I'm gonna be waiting until I'm qualified. There's a lot of reasons why you might wanna get a new consumer unit. It could be damaged, it could have no spare ways, it could have no RCD protection or ugh, rewirable fuses, yuck. I know that my own consumer unit only has one RCD protecting half of the circuits and it's well over 20 years old and I'm running out of space. Okay, but if we just want the consumer unit to be fixed, that'll fix the problem, right? Well, you might now be highlighting some problems on circuits that weren't picked up with the old school fuse wire. This could mean nuisance tripping, it could also be a fairly expensive cost when there are more pressing issues that need fixing on a system. This is why it's important for all electrical systems connected to be checked and inspected before a board change. This can then make sure that if we were to replace that consumer unit that it would work out, right? Maybe you've seen it where every 20 or 30 years an extra circuit is needed but there's just no more room in that board. So another small consumer unit is added, and before you know it, there's three different consumer units of three different eras. They're squished into the space that should only really occupy one consumer unit. Maybe it was done on the cheap, and therefore a little bit cheaper to add another small consumer unit rather than consolidating them into one model consumer unit. But come on, we can see the dangers, right? That brings me on to super old consumer units. 
the sort that just have fuse wire. They're often found under the stairs, and when the fuse wire decides to pop, it can be a bit of a mission to get them replaced. The problem with fuse wire is that it's not fast reacting like circuit breakers, so the fault could go on for some time. They also have no RCD protection. So, well, you know, if you get a shock and touch the live, or worse, could be your kids. To give an example, a little while back, I stupidly touched one of those neon voltage indicator screwdrivers against a light and circuit terminal, and it shorted against the metal case. The board behind that circuit was a board like the one I'm describing. And just to make the point, yeah, the fuse didn't blow. After I'd done my little bit of welding and pulled my screwdriver away, that's what broke the connection. Mm. A consumer unit with a slight upgrade would be one that takes cartridge fuses. But if you start getting issues and one of these pops, you need to head down to your local electrical wholesaler. This could be quite easy, but it could also be a Sunday evening and are you going to call an electrician out so that they can charge you a call out charge just to replace a fuse? So. What is our all singing, all dancing, modern consumer unit alternatives? Well, for a start, a nice double pole isolator in the consumer unit. So we're breaking the line and the neutral conductor. In addition to circuit breakers, which are resettable, we also have RCD protection and the ability to have way more ways. With more people wanting lights, battery storage, electric cars, heat pumps, having a consumer unit with spare ways is a good idea. I looked at some other things that you may want to put in a consumer unit, such as combining an RCD and a circuit breaker together to make an RCBO, residual current circuit breakers. Something which I'll be doing along with some other options such as arc fault protection devices. Those aren't cheap is my understanding. Depending on your use case, you might want to add timers, contactors or bell transformers all of these are designed to work on the DIN rail in a consumer unit. I then looked at all the steps that we take to replace a consumer unit, which I'll put on the screen now. Just highlighting one or two, I touched on it before, but the first part in replacing a consumer unit is to inspect and test the condition of the existing install. It's no good replacing a consumer unit on circuits that are just not capable or set up right. Say for example that you had a ring, which is currently on a 32 amp breaker, and then in your inspection and testing, you discover that it has a broken ring and it's been split in two at some point. So that two and a half mil cable would no longer be capable for what it's meant to do. So it should either be repaired or down rated to a 20 amp radial. Or what if one of the circuits goes all the way down the garden and you've calculated that the voltage drop is gonna put it out of the current regulations? Something's gonna need to be done before that circuit is connected to the consumer unit, right? The final step, of course, is building regs. They're going to want to know about the install. If you've paid up the money, that's the job of the competent person scheme to inform building regs. I'll leave it there for this week. I'm going to look a little bit closer at the circuits that we connect to the consumer unit and just run through some of the information that I'm going to need to know in next week. Until then, battery man out.